Today we turn to the Gospel of Matthew where we've been resting for the past couple of weeks. And this time we turn to chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his faults. Between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So today, we get to talk about a fun topic in the church. Conflict. Who's excited? But today we need to hear the word of God in relationship to conflict. You see, it seems crazy because we're a church, right? And conflict and church do not go together. That to even consider such a thing is blasphemous, right? We know what's wrong. I know. I know. We're human. Humans have conflict. End of story. No more needs to be said, right? Too bad you get another 15 minutes. <laughs> so how do we approach conflict biblically? And how do we approach it as both individuals and as a body of believers? You see, conflict in the church is inevitable. But how we handle it, deal with it, name it, own it, and most importantly, how we grow from it helps us utilize conflict for the glory of God. That in itself is a little bit of a strange way of looking at it, right? Using conflict to glorify God. Now we're really talking heresy. Conflict, though, has a negative connotation. While we may or may not dismiss words and their similar meanings to one another, we cannot discount that two words may mean very similar things, but can give a very different connotative feel to the circumstances for which they are used. We have to understand the language we use in the church and in and throughout our lives. To not understand that language we use and to fail to use it properly often helps to create, foster, and even build into the conflicts that are already inherent within the body. So what is conflict? The definition we would be using is in the noun form and it means discord of action feeling or effect, antagonism or opposition as of interest or principles. And that is a direct quote from Webster's Dictionary.com thing. They don't even print out dictionaries anymore. I don't know. <laughs> Essentially, what this means in light of the church is that we have opposing viewpoints on how or what or when to do whatever in the life of the church. We all agree? Does that definition sound right? But often, what we do, instead of this milder definition, we tend to take the other definition of conflict as in battle, and we draw our little lines in the sand and gather our forces of righteous Christian friends 
to fight it out, and of course the most faithful will win. We too often, though, see the fallout of this battleground mentality in the life of our churches. You see, conflict in the church is not supposed to be about winning or losing. But instead, it is about growing and seeing one another's different views in light of God. Too often, though, conflict can create a level of discord and, more importantly, a level of hurt that people as individuals and the church as a body cannot always overcome. Sometimes we do shake it off. And other times, though, the conflict circles around something that is of paramount importance to us personally in the life of the church. Things like how we worship, or what we do as our mission, or the music, or a variety of other things. The lines get drawn, and inevitably what it, the end result is that someone leaves, or the discord continues, and the conflict never gets resolved. Instead, it's pushed to the side, or the group in quote-unquote power does it their way, with the ever-present mumblings of those who did not get what they wanted still lurking in the corners of the sanctuary or in the parking lot after the service has ended. We all know. I'm not preaching to the choir because they're down here. <laughs> A couple of weeks ago, though, we had the annual ministry training workshop. You know, the thing that I started that's in August that half of you were not there for. This year's workshop centered on worship and what we could cover in a short time span on all that goes into a church worship service. I think it surprised some people. But an activity that we did centered on the most important elements in our worship service. One of the most revealing things that I believe came to light from this and surprised those who participated was that the only piece of music that was deemed important as a must-have was the offering in music. Everything else is not given the same level of importance as the other elements like communion, the scripture, or even the sermon. This is revealing and surprising in some ways considering that most of us are familiar with church life are well aware that the devil enters the sanctuary through the choir law. We've heard that one, right? We've heard it. We are, and our, most of us have experienced it a time or two. The blunt truth is that most church conflicts deals with music, the type of what is sung, the way it is sung, who sings it, when, etc. And I want to be clear on one thing. I'm not pointing fingers or drawing lines in the sand. I just know how important it is for us as a church and as individuals to understand and appreciate one another before, in the middle of, and after periods of conflict. And use them as methods and modes of spiritual growth as individuals and both as the body. You see, as disciples of Christ, we live under a belief System. We continually say in essentials unity, in non essentials charity, and in everything love. We tend to forget that principle of belief and understanding during periods of conflict. We tend to dwell on the non essentials and forget to be charitable and loving towards one another. Because at the end of the day, it is not what we were discussing that matters, but rather how we discuss it that matters. People don't get upset over the issue so much as the feelings that get hurt over how they are treated throughout the disagreement. You see, compromise and working together take a backseat to power and control and charity and love get left completely in the dust as we barrel on towards some end. 
My friends, we have, as disciples of Christ in particular, a belief system that equalizes us. There is no hierarchy in our faith. Because we believe in the inherent saving nature of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of our lives in the world, we are all called to be Christ in this world. Each person who believes is on equal footing with the next who also believes in that saving grace. You see, how we practice that belief or live it out does differ. But let us be honest in admitting that in our striving to live a life like Jesus, we sometimes instead find ourselves more like the Pharisees in our holier-than-thou attitude over the humility of Christ. We are human, after all. But to hear, in the Gospel of Matthew, we are given a guideline of sorts. To see one another with eyes of grace as we come to points of disagreement and conflict, whatever and whenever those points may be. Let's take a moment to look at these guidelines. See, this chapter in Matthew is the go-to guide for conflict resolution. It shows us the biblical way of handling and dealing with conflict. And the first thing to note is that this is an aggressive tactic. It does not ask you to sit passively. It instead asks you to take action to resolve conflict so that it does not hinder us in our faith lives. We know that to be true, right? Conflict and disagreement and discord hinder us as people, as spiritual people. So that's important to note. Not acting quickly and acknowledging and then handling the conflict makes it typically more difficult to be resolved and it often means that we lose our patience in being gracious and loving and most importantly, forgiving of one another. So the conflict typically snowballs from a simple thing between two individuals into a me versus them versus us versus everyone problem, creating a chasm that can take years or is sometimes never truly resolved. So by taking a look at the scripture, it starts by saying if one sins against you, go to them directly and talk to them about it directly. I think that's the most important step. You see, our first inclination if somebody tees us off is instead of talking to them about it, who do we go to? We talk to our spouse about it. We talk to our friends about it. Anyone but them, right? Our first inclination is to talk about it with others. Instead of just saying to a person you may need, you know, you may not have realized it, but you kind of just hurt my feelings. Or I disagree with you on whatever. If we went to one another first, how fewer battle lines would be drawn? The second step, my friends, is to take a couple others along with you. This is where it gets tricky. Because those others are not there to back you up in what you say or believe. They are not there to defend your point. But rather, their purpose is to act as mediators. Jesus says that these individuals essentially confirm what has been said between the two parties and give evidence to both sides of the discussion. We tell our youth to get a trusted adult, like a youth director, because for, and for adults it can be the elders of the church or the minister. The important thing is that they are not directly involved and are, 
and all who are aware in the discussion are aware of the biases that are inherent within that discussion. Like I said, it's tricky. It is incredibly difficult as humans to not take sides. But the third step, if that doesn't resolve it, is to bring it in front of the group, the church, or the group affected by the conflict. This is invariably a difficult step and also a humbling step. We also very rarely get to this point within our church because it is easier to walk away, right? But the hurt remains, my friends. The people affected remain, and sometimes the instigators leaving and not taking ownership solves absolutely nothing. And that is where the fourth and final step comes in to play. Jesus tells us to let them be to us as a gentleman <coughs> and a tax collector. In a quick interpretation, this is kind of a fun way of saying, I dismiss what you've said, and I'm going to shame you for being that way. Because, of course, to those of this time, the Gentiles and the tax collectors were reviled by the Jewish culture. And yet, throughout the Gospels, these were the very people that Jesus went to and loved. In spite of their status, he saw beyond the stigma and loved them anyway. That's how we resolve conflict. We love them anyway. It doesn't negate the need for addressing it, but it does ask us to consciously see one another with eyes of grace and love one another anyway. No matter what has been done against us as individuals or as the body. It's not perfect. I'm sure as I'm saying, most of you are going, yeah, that doesn't work. Right? But it's a way for us to see conflict as a way of glorifying God. Conflict's not the best word, but there's not, is there another? But when we love one another anyway, when we go to one another, when we address it, we name it, we own it, when we accept that it is part of our spiritual growth and identification as disciples of Christ, then we get to come together. And we get to glorify God together by agreeing to dis disagree. And by honoring one another's differing views. And coming together in worship and in praise of our God in spite of and perhaps because of our unique differences. Remember, the end of this scripture tells us the simple truth. That where two or more are gathered in Jesus' name, he is here. Amen.